So let's talk about your musical history a little bit. So um, when did you start learning to play? I mean, what made you want to play? What were you into? Oh, God. What was I? I started playing guitar when I was 12, I think. Just got a guitar for a birthday or something. You know, Mm -hmm. my parents bought it for me. I kind of noodled around on it visited a friend over the summer and then got hooked. I, he played guitar and showed me kind of a little bit more on how I could do it. Was hooked, started playing guitar, uh, was in a metal band in high school. Oh, okay. And started a death metal band. Nice. Uh, finished. Yeah. Finished that in high school. And then I joined and went to college and I joined like an indie folk band. That's playing, a switch. That was a hard left. Why not? <laughs> Uh, so now were your, were your parents, I don't know if you have any brothers and sisters. I mean, mm-hmm. was there music around the house or is it uh, not, nothing remarkable? My parents would have, you know, have the radio on here and there. They'd play CDs or we'd go to a con- couple concerts here or there. I wouldn't, I would say average music listeners. Uh, okay. Parents, what was your both, first concert? First concert. Oh boy. First concert. I saw uh, nine inch nails with a band called death from above 1979, uh, back at the 2000 something, whatever. I don't even remember when it was, but I think I must've been like 12 years old to convince my mom to take me to that. Nice. What nice. about you? She, oh man. I was also 12 years old, but of course this dates me. I, I went to Ozzy. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah. I went the diary of a madman tour and I actually had it's a true story, you know, cause Randy Rhodes, the famous mm-hmm. guitarist on the first two, um, Ozzy albums, you know, he died in a plane crash. I actually had tickets to the concert cause, cause Randy Rhodes was, was a legend even by that, that point. Yeah. I mean, the, the first record had come out, he was touring for the second record and I was just, Oh my God, my first concert, I'm going to be able to see Randy Rhodes. I didn't. He, he died in the plane crash when I, I actually had my ticket. So Brad Gillis, the guitarist for Night Ranger, uh, eventually, um, he was the guitarist on that on that concert, you know, and of course he did a fantastic job. I mean, talk about a hard gig. Yeah. You know, you got a stadium full of people that are just like completely bummed that Randy Rhodes has just died and, and you're the other guy, you know, so. Yeah, tough uh, shoes of course to fill. Was, yeah, no, no question. No question. But still, it was, a, you know, it was a great show. And I'm sure I am 110% sure that my dad, I was not allowed to be there. I think I snuck out or, or something. Yeah. <laughs> Somehow I made it in. But, you know, I lived to tell to tell. Uh, so, like, do you have any kind of like a musical education? Did you take lessons? Do you know music theory or do you know how to read or? I figured out. Yeah. So I started, I guess my, I guess musical journey journey started. I was in middle school band and i started i joined middle school band because i went to like an arts yeah i went to like an arts magnet school and every every like two months or so you'd rotate doing visual art and then you'd be an orchestra you'd like rotate Mm. between all the different arts and the girl that i liked in middle school was like i'm joining band so i said i'm joining band too uh Uh, yeah started playing trumpet yeah exactly so that uh, that's what kind of kicked off the whole thing. Uh, so I took lessons, learned to read music a little bit, f- promptly forgot all of it uh, as soon as that ended. And then I guess over the, over the years, I've kind of picked music theory back up uh, yeah. a little bit. I, I don't know why I say a little bit. Like I feel like I understand what's going on. I can do Nashville charts. Uh, I'd say that was a big okay. that was a big part of it for me living in Nashville up there. They uh, they use like a number system for notation mm-hmm. that's different than uh different than just sheet music it's just easier for session players to come in and be able to read it so uh that was my first experience just being being around it a lot in the studio i just picked that up and started figuring out major firsts and minor minor chord figuring out how it all came together as a glue yeah. nice nice do you feel like because theory is definitely something with with myself especially when the pandemic happened, um, you know, I felt we found ourselves going from playing two, three gigs a week for seven, eight years to zero, which was completely yeah. bizarre. It was bizarre for everybody. I'm not special in that regard, but I was kind of, I was literally like, wow, 
I'm going to have weekends off apparently for quite a while. What should I do? You know? And of course I was worried about what the band was going to do. And I still had these bills I had to pay at a rehearsal space, all this stuff. We figured that out. But, but I, I definitely sat down. I was like, okay, this is for a good time for me to really seriously focus on music theory and really try to figure this stuff out. And I had to, and, but the method that I used, it seems to have worked for me is I, I thought about artists who I really love their stuff. And I know that if I had, if I, and one of them is electric light orchestra, ELO, um, if you're, you know, Mr. Blue Sky, you're probably mm-hmm. familiar. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, you know, but he, but Jeff Lynn is actually the band leader for that. And I've talked about this in other podcast episodes. P- people get sick of it, but that's okay. Cause it's my podcast. You should listen to Jeff Lynn, but I consider him to be the greatest songwriter maybe on the planet. And, but I had to sit and I, I, I went, why do I love his music so much? What is something that, what is he doing chord wise that just appeals to my, you know, to yeah. appeals to me, you know, and, and why? And so I, you know, so I just kind of started there and that's when I started learning about borrowed chords and, you know, things like that. And I really try to, now I don't want to write music that sounds like him, but I did, I did want to at least have the knowledge to understand, Hey, if, okay, that's what he's doing that. I understand that. And maybe I could work that into, into one of my songs or something like it. So that's, so I had an objective. It's kind of like a lot of people, you know, when they start learning how to play, they want to learn how to shred, right? But they don't mm-hmm. just come up with this idea. I just want to play really fast notes on a guitar. It's because they, you know, hear death metal or whatever, and something appeals to them. Like, I want to learn to do that. How in the hell do I learn how to do that? You know, thank God for YouTube again. You know, yeah. Being able so, to teach. And I feel like emulating is the, I, I I started that way, and I think a lot of people start that way. It is yeah, emulating the music that you're listening to, and do, like doing critical listening. Like, how did they get? Why does the guitar sound that way? Oh, it's in the left channel. How? Why is it sound so bright here? What you start asking questions about what you're listening to, and can start emulating, putting that stuff into your own kind of productions as you're learning to produce. Yeah, yeah. It's funny. I was thinking one time semi recently about, you know, cause we, we pretty much play a lot of funk We're a funk band, Reverend Barry and the funk. And, you know, but I didn't really get exposed to funk in a big way until I was in my thirties and I actually did it. I was staying at a friend's house, uh, crashed on her couch, literally back in LA and she went to work and I had nothing to do. I don't think I even had a car at the time. It was like this really weird period of my life. And I was going through her music collection and she had a cool in the gang's greatest hits. I'm like, well, okay. I like a few cool in the gang songs. And I started listening to that stuff and I had my bass with me and I was listening to that guy play. And I was like, I don't play like that. I like what he's doing, but I know that I don't play that way. And I know his note mm-hmm. choices is not something that I would normally do, but I really liked it. And then I just started really listening to the licks and working on them. And, and, you know, and here I am, you know, however many years later at a funk band, you know, it's play, it's fun to play funk bass, of course. If you want to play I've, it all the time. You I wish I could. Time. That'd be great. <laughs> but it all started with Cool and the Gang's greatest hits. So uh, now you said you played in a band in Nashville. I mean, have you ever toured or anything? Done the whole like the festival circuit or any of that kind of thing? Never done the festival circuit. Toured a little bit. Uh, yeah, in and around Nashville, and then with my own stuff. Probably I'm trying to. I've lost track of time because I feel like 2020 didn't happen. So sometime just before then I had uh, done a two week run from Florida up and down the East coast up to New York. Oh, okay. How'd that go? Was that a learning experience? A good, yeah. Good. Being out, I think being on the road is, uh, it's, it's completely different than anything you can, you can prep for. There's a lot of driving. There's a lot of downtime. Uh, all just for that, like 40 minutes that you get to play at night. So there's a lot involved with it. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Now I, I know that you had, you had introduced me via email to your manager. Mm-hmm. So what, what's his name? Uh, Chris, Chris Goizetta. Okay. And so what does Chris help you do? I mean, cause you're, you're not, you don't actually have a band now. You're not really actively touring, Mm-mm. right? Not, not okay. at the moment. No. So how did you, how did he find you or did you find him and kind of what's, what's his role in your career at this point? Yeah. Chris and I actually just started our relationship together oh, okay. pretty, pretty dang recently. Um, and we we met kind of through a mutual friend. Uh, he's based, he's based here in Florida as well. Uh, hopefully not, 
hopefully I remember all of this correctly, but he used to be a talent buyer for uh, AEG and Live Nation. Uh, was in the live concert space, uh, bouncing mm-hmm. all all around the southeast southeastern U.S. And yeah, you know, we met through a friend, uh, a good friend of mine who's also a musician. I uh, had done some work with Chris. Yeah, it's a, like a who you know kind of thing, and made the introduction recently. And it just it kind of made sense to to have Chris on board to do. I guess kind of be a little bit of a filter for me. So I get hit up to do, to sing on certain stuff and get a lot of projects inbound to be able to kind of help filter and prioritize that. And then do, uh, do some of the heavy lifting on marketing when I'm releasing music so frequently. I see. Okay, cool. Cool. Well, I, we, our band has a manager too. We were approached by a, um, a guy a couple of years ago. His name's Artie Fletcher. Um, some people may actually know Artie is he's a, he's a actor and a comedian. He was in, um, NYPD blue and, and some other TV shows playing bit parts and he's a comedian, but he, he managed bands kind of back in the day. Mm-hmm. And he actively, our, our band is very different in that we, you know, like I said, it's live performance is a lot of our stuff. Um, you know, so he's, he books the band actively, but then, you know, he does help, you know, cause they're with eight people with two crew members, and all the stuff that we have to do all the time, there's a lot to be managed, especially yeah. when it comes to dealing, dealing with venues, dealing with inquiries for private events. And, you know, of course we're not getting a lot of those. Um, we used to before the pandemic, you know, and yeah. just fielding those follow-ups and the phone calls and all that kind of stuff. And then, you know, and then even just having a sounding board, you know, cause we've had some, some member issues as all bands do. And, you know, having somebody who, who, you know, the, the, business of the band is their also their main objective. Mm -hmm. That's my main objective, but it's also his. And, you know, he's the one that kind of helps sometimes does the tough talk and, and it's like, look, you know, the band is the most important thing. And this situation that that we're in is is not conducive to that. And that's why this change might need to be made or or something to that effect and kind of help you because, you know, being in a band can be such an emotional, you know, thing with, with people and, you know, it, it just it's a is. family. It's a big family. Yeah, exactly. exactly. You know, so managers can definitely fill different roles, I believe. So I was just kind of, I was cu- definitely curious when I saw you had that going on. Cause I know that your, your music career has taken a very different path than mine. You know, it seems. Yeah. It's, it's just having somebody at a 30,000 foot view outside of, um, outside of your band or outside of your project that, want when it makes sense for your band like these i feel like those sorts of relationships you start you start to develop um based on what it is you need and i know a lot of artists are still just doing like doing it all themselves and that's also amazing yeah and it's it's so and and some people you know he came to us he actually saw the same video the one that we're using to sell all the cds you know, it's a song of ours. It's kind of taken off. It's called love shine. It's been kind of our hit, if you will. And he saw that and he approached us and, you know, I know that I've, I've seen a lot of artists like on Reddit and Facebook groups and all that, you know, do I need a manager or when should I, mm-hmm. could, how do I find a manager? And sometimes I, I, I just know that what happened with, with us is, you know, the manager found us because we were, we were doing it all ourselves. You know, I was doing it all. And I was definitely ready to hand over the reins on a lot of the stuff, but I was also very cautious, of course, you know, and, and especially when it came to booking, I was like, you know, I said, look, man, because I've been approached by numerous people throughout the years. Oh, I'd love to do booking for your band. And pretty much my answer was always go ahead. Well, what do you mean? If you can show me that you can book the band, then we can talk, but talk is cheap. You know, I, I'm not going to hand, I remember I went, to, there was an agent early on that, you know, he, we approached him an agent and a manager are two different things for sure. But, you know, he, he was a big, bigger booking agent in Tampa. And I, you know, I went to him, see if he could help us out with some bookings. And he was kind of like, Hey man, you know, love to help you. Great band. But, um, you know, I usually sign exclusive of my acts. And I, just, I literally told him and I threw, I'm sure you think I was an arrogant ass. I was like, okay, stop right there what do you mean? I said, I'm not going to sign an exclusive with anyone. Well, it's just kind of how I normally work. I said, I said, you know, just, just roll with me for a second here. It, I have eight people in my band that are all counting on my band to be booked. That's why they've committed to this and why they've been rehearsing for the last four or five months without any gigs. 
or however long it took us. I said, I, I can't hand the reins over to anybody else. I'm going to do this. If you can help us get some bookings now, you know, make some money on us. Mm-hmm. Then after a six month period or whatever, and you're just getting one after the other. Sure. I'll hand the keys over. Well, the thing I loved about Artie is he, he understood that with my, me even ha- having to say anything. He, he basically said, tell you what, I'll start booking you and just see what you think. And you got to find somebody sudden. that's on the same wavelength as you. That's a yeah. big thing. You can't just every, yeah, everybody wants like representation or what you got to find somebody that's in, in your lane, like speaks your language from, from the get go. Uh, it makes yeah. sense for, for what you're trying to do. And I'll never forget. It was Sunday night when he called me, which is weird because I don't even take phone calls on Sunday nights. And then by Wednesday, he called me and said, okay, I got you booked at so-and-so. I'm like, you did? It was three days later, you know? And he, he said, I told you I was, and he's, he's really kind of, he's a funny, he's, he's kind of arrogant. And, but that's part of his shtick too, as being a comedian. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he just started proving himself and, you know, before or I mean, it only made sense for us to hand it over. But uh, yeah, I would say because it, it is a lot of work. I mean, you know, all this booking stuff and all that, but you also need somebody who's a cheerleader. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I know that like he'll call up these manufacturers and stuff, try to get us endorsement deals and all that. And he'll follow up with them. He'll follow up with sponsorship deals like beer companies and stuff. And he just sells. It's constantly selling. You know, this is why you need to do this. This band's blowing up, blah, blah, blah. You know, I'm not going to do that for myself. No. I don't have time. And it's plus, it's not in my personality. Oh, we're the greatest band ever. Just ask me. You know, it's. <laughs> you need <laughs> to be outside of yourself to. You can't be your. You can be your mom's favorite band, but that can't be your. Like, yeah, can't be your only thing. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So now you said you're you're moving to Los Angeles soon. What What's what's your thoughts there? Um thoughts there trying to do it last year but obviously that uh that didn't end up happening yeah i'd be glad you didn't yeah for real i know that i know that things have been kind of tough out there um yeah i mean it i i travel out there semi-frequently enough that i just started making sense to be there to be able to do some songwriting in person when that starts uh opening back up my wife is an actress uh, oh okay cool so it just yeah, yeah, for both sense. for what both of us are doing, uh, it it makes yeah it makes sense I think to be to be there and present uh, at least working in the pop pop music business that, that I'm in songwriters producers uh, collaborators yeah, sure. doing sync uh, I do a lot of sync so being out in Los Angeles all that stuff is out there as well or not all of it I don't want to discredit music supervisors elsewhere but a lot of it is happening there. Yeah, for sure. Well, that's a perfect segue. So let's talk about sync. Cause I know this is, this is, I'm sure it's a big piece of your, of your business, yeah. but before we dive into sync licensing, could you define what it is for our audience? Cause there's some people that might be listening that don't really understand what sync licensing is. Sure. Sure. Uh, sync licensing or short for synchronization license is a license that allows somebody to use a piece of music. I feel like a textbook right now uh, that allows somebody <laughs> to use a piece of music in a to synchronize it with a visual work of some kind. So, in practicality, that's when you're watching a YouTube video and there's music playing behind the ad. That's a synchronization. They used a recording and synced it up with a piece of audiovisual content. So I do, I do a lot of sync licensing by letting TV shows and uh, so social media companies, advertisements, all that sort of stuff, use my music in their, um, in their campaigns or feature them in TV episodes, that sort of thing, that sort of thing. Okay, cool. So, and I kind of know the answers to these questions, but you would, you would give a better answer because you're actually actively doing it. And I I love to hear your answer. So why is that a big deal money wise? Because that the, the pay structure is a little different than maybe other things, like getting a song played on the radio. How would, how would it be different? Yeah. Uh, so I guess when a song plays on the radio, how is that different? I'll separate it, not from radio, but from like something more practical, like Spotify streams. Okay. Uh, Perfect. So when you get paid by Spotify, if you've released through DistroKid or TuneCore or something every month uh, or every quarter, however often it is, they deposit money in your account. And that's Spotify saying a portion of what a, these users did this month generated this many plays for this song, and they have a royalty rate that Spotify has to pay 
um, depending on how many people stream the song. So it gets a million million plays. It uh, ends up being about four thousand dollars. So they pay out direct. Um, that that payment isn't just for one thing, but let's for the sake of argument, let's just say you upload, create a song, put it online, and then Spotify pays you directly. That's in contrast to like sync licensing, where what I'm licensing for a t- for a TV show, for instance, is the TV show will come to me and say, we want to use this song of yours in an upcoming episode about this, and we're willing to give you uh, this amount of money, an upfront sum of money to be able to do that. And mm-hmm. then in tandem, I also get paid because it's being broadcast on television. Uh, I'm also getting paid from my performing rights company. I- I'm on ASCAP. There's ASCAP and BMI uh, here in the US. Those uh, organizations also pay out every time a show or a song is broadcast on television. So I, I get paid up front uh, to use this, the recording and then get paid uh, performance royalties down the road. Okay, great. That's that's a perfect explanation. I knew you would be better at explaining it than me. Um, so have you... So like if a if a show, so every time that show airs, like if it were, I always think about it was whoever made that little bass sound that on the Seinfeld, I don't know if that's a sync license, but you oh. know, think about, about Seinfeld being in syndication now for what, mm-hmm. 25 years. I don't know if he gets paid every single time that no, that sound is played, but I uh, believe that he does. And fun, funny enough, the reason that he gets paid so much is every one of them is different. It was recorded live for every single episode. I found that wow. out recently, uh, just because this, the length of that stand up that Jerry does at the beginning is a little different every time. So he yeah. like modifies that little bass thing for every single episode. They obviously don't do it that way anymore. Right. That would never get approved at the budget level. Um, but yeah, so every time, uh, every, if a show goes to syndication, uh, that'll live in perpetuity. Uh, I will say with a caveat though that that's kind of limited to broadcast television, uh, Netflix and Hulu and all, all the like on-demand streaming, they're getting, they're kind of wising up to that practice, mm. uh, for better or worse, and are now just offering one flat bulk rate. It's usually a higher rate than a network TV show pays, but it's, here's a chunk of money and we'll never bother you again. We're not going to pay you royalties. If, if this is the next stranger things, tough. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard about that was kind of a big controversy in the, in the, in the field of, mm-hmm. so basically you're saying, so that money that they would, would normally go through ASCAP, um, that you would get up get in your, well, Willie Nelson used to call mailbox money, um, right. that they're basically buying you out in effect because Netflix, I, the way that the contracts are structured, number one is basically Netflix has them betting. They want you to bet on the success of a show and a show on Netflix, like stranger things, for instance, Netflix is trying to protect itself in five years. If they decide to put that on broadcast television, they mm. want to they want to buy out all the rights up front, so that they never, if they want to use it in a commercial in Thailand or put it on a billboard, they don't they don't want to have to worry about relicensing for all of that other stuff. Whereas with broadcast television, um, cable TV, they are by law required to pay broadcast performance rights. So anytime a song plays on television that's playing out loud, they are by law required to pay me and anybody else that syncs music to television that fee. So Netflix gets kind of ahead of that and says, well, right now, technically we're on demand. So we're not broadcasting it to anybody uh, on the same way. Just go ahead and sign this contract now so that if we ever do have to broadcast it on a TV commercial during the Super Bowl or something, we're not uh, we're not on the hook for it. So right. it's just okay. kind of a future proofing problem. Okay. So let me, let's go ahead and ask the question. I'm sure that anybody who's interested in sync placements or maybe had one or two, the burning question that's on everyone's mind. Cause you said you've had around 60. At I this think point? probably it's uh, 60 or 70, somewhere, somewhere around there. Okay. So that's fantastic. So how, 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 how are you able to do this? Um, I, if I can just take like a little a bit of a journey, uh, real quick. So I, the first sync, 
that I ever, ever had. I was in college and I had made like some instrumental songs and I just put them up on the internet and I emailed some music bloggers. That was all, that was popular at the time. And I had no, I'd seen my favorite bands get written up in music blogs. I emailed some music blogs. I make music, please. Uh, write about me. Yeah, please write about me. That was all I knew how to do. Uh, and uh, weirdly enough, I, a couple of just like out there music blogs ended up writing about this project. Long story short, one of the guys that was writing for the blog ends up getting a job at Viacom, at, like doing music supervision. Viacom owns MTV, uh, VH1, I think Comedy yeah. Central, like go down the list. Um, so he ends up getting a job there, hits me up out of the blue, maybe two years after this first blog feature it says, Hey man, I remember liking your stuff. Can we use it in this upcoming MTV show? I said, sure. The songs end up getting placed. I get a couple hundred bucks and that was kind of the end of it. It was complete happenstance. I had no, I didn't go into it trying to get my music on television. All that happened was I like it clicked people, people license music on television. Aha. Yeah. It okay. was a moment. Uh, and so when I had finished some new music, uh, kind of fast forwarding through Nashville and all of the, all of that, forget all of that. Uh, when I had some new music back here in Florida, I remembered previously, oh, I'd had some success getting music on television. And so I, at the time, I just decided to kind of reverse engineer or do what I thought was reverse engineering the process by just watching television, TV and film and stuff and just watching into the credits to see who the music supervisors and who the music licensing companies were that all of these TV shows were using. Uh, and so I made a big list of all of the companies uh, that I found and I would, I was shazamming, like I would hear bands that sounded similar to the music that I had. And I was like, Oh, Hey Siri, who's that band? Like holding it up to the TV, that sort of stuff. Uh, and I just made a big list of companies that I thought made sense and started reaching out saying i have new music i know that sync licensing is a thing i own my mastering i'm on publishing are you interested in working together on some of these songs and heard back from a couple different agencies and uh have been the one that i ended up going with i i'm really really a big fan of they're called castle peak music out of uh los angeles and it's been a great it's been a great relationship with that so that's that's always my like default advice because people hit me up all the time how do i mm -hmm. get into sync how do i get into sync and my advice always is like just watch tv just sit down you're doing it anyway just like sit down and watch television shows shazam the band go to their website and see who does their licensing interesting yeah that's cool because i've in fact, that I, now that I've been, this has been more on my radar lately. I find myself doing that. We're, we're of course, you know, my wife and I, we are we're always Netflixing or Amazoning some kind of show, mm -hmm. and, you know, in the evenings. And recently, it's been, um, oh, uh, New Amsterdam, the hospital show. It's a really good one. Um, I'll check that. But out. yeah, I could just it, it as it's going through, it's playing these, you know, these emotional scenes. I can always tell. It's like a, there's always like these little indie kind of songwriter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm acoustic guitar, really emotional kind of ballads in the background and stuff. And I'm thinking, you know, somebody just, somebody's got to pay, you know, it's like, and it's amazing when you pay attention to it, how much is actually in there. I mean, there's music makes a huge difference to the flow of any TV show. Yeah. I'd say any cute, they're called cues, uh, C U E. So any musical cue in a TV show, if it's more than 30 seconds, like it's a long cue. Like if you're, mm -hmm. if you're actively paying attention to the music in a TV show, it's changing very, 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 very quickly. So they they use they go through a lot of different sounds on on TV shows. It's for sure. Okay, so so you have a company then. So you have a publishing company that that you in work a, in effect, not technically, but in effect, they act on behalf of my publishing to represent my my songs uh, in that space. Okay. So I, I, I'm kind of looking, looking at your process. Cause it, you know, you said in the early stages with your Spotify playlist, you were just like, Hey, I, or you, you mentioned the YouTube playlist, mm -hmm. you know, you just went direct. You went, Hey, you have music on your YouTube. I make music. Let's see what we can do. You know, kind of thing. Yeah. And then you reached out in the same way to music supervisors essentially. And, and then, you know, then over time is that, that grew up, you, you kind of, you know, you got into the publishing companies kind of representing you and, and, um, is that pretty, so I, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is you kind of had that, what they call guerrilla marketing approach in the beginning, just go direct. 
Yeah, I didn't I didn't know any better. I like now I know there's a lot of conversations, a lot of people are trying to figure out how to get into sync. Um and I think that the I think that the direct approach works at least in that space. Um I don't think it's necessarily as kind of ethereal as it as it seems to be. Like you're not going to go from zero to Grey's Anatomy like right mm. away. That those mm. you have to build up those sorts of relationships. Uh but you can't, yeah, just email people. Like you make something that at least in the, if you're a music supervisor, you need new music all the time. Yeah. Constantly, constantly need new stuff to be pitching um, for TV show. Nobody wants to use three-year-old, four-year-old songs. They want something mm. that's hot and current and they want to be cool and seem cool just like all of the other TV shows. Uh, and the reason people stop and Shazam stuff on Grey's Anatomy is because it sounds cool. And so music supervisors, you have something that they want and need. Um, so yeah. it made sense to to do the active outreach. They're not going to just, nobody's just going to find me. Uh, right, right. So, you know, and in fact, I was listening to an interview with the music su- supervisor and, and the thing I thought was also pertinent was she, she said she would, she gets this music constantly coming to her. And even though she might not use it right at that moment, she might, she has like a probably just a big hard drive or something just full of mm-hmm. like, you know, genres or moods or all of the above. And I've heard of stories of people getting, you know, she's like, oh, okay, I need a, I need a country song to go with this particular thing. And she goes, country, 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 you know, and she goes back mm-hmm. down and she might find your song that you sent to her six months before. And you just, you know, uh, I think Ari Herstan had a, had a situation like that. That's kind of how he developed a relationship. And I'm sure if you're familiar with him, but uh, he has a really good podcast. Um, and that's exactly what happened. She contacted him months later. She actually had turned him down for um, one episode and never heard from her until six months later. And, and then of course, then she needed something super quick. So um, now it's important. Is it important? You mentioned uh, owning your masters and, and having your own, your publishing hundred percent. Is that, a big deal. Yeah. So I think the big thing, um, sorry if I'm talking too much about, about sync. So I'd say owning your masters and owning your publishing is, uh, is number one because nobody, nobody wants to end up in like a legal fiasco by using something that they don't have a hundred percent of the rights to. So owning your own master who, the person who has say over what happens to the sound recording itself, obviously super important. You don't want to be like juggling contracts with a label in between you. Like everybody needs to be on the same page in the same way that you have to also have uh, own all the publishing or at least have permission from the other publishers or other songwriters that were on there that day to have permission to pitch the song because you don't want to end up having a song get pitched to like, I don't know, to Jimmy Dean sausage commercial, but one of the songwriters is vegan and is now super upset or doesn't want that to happen. Like that's a crazy example, but yeah, uh, being able to come into the conversation with sync and say like, I own everything and we're all up to speed. Good to go. I've got the instrumental versions. I've got the full versions. Just getting to the starting line, I think is a lot farther than most people get. Just having your paperwork in order uh, before approaching some of those agents. I, And I guess a spinoff of that, I think the importance of going to an agent or going to a library or having somebody represent your catalog rather than trying to go to the music supervisors directly is, I guess, a a legitimacy thing because your your agent is going to make sure that all of the paperwork is all the T's are crossed and all the I's are dotted before they start pitching your songs. A music supervisor is working on such a tight deadline on some of these shows, like it could be two hours or three hours between something getting finalized and the time it goes on television, they're not going to try and get a hold of your band. Like your, your band, you're, you're at work or doing whatever. They're not going to, they want to be able to call like a phone number and speak to somebody and be like, let's get this straightened out and get all the, the things signed so that we can make this happen rather than trying to track down your, your band on Instagram or something. Yeah, for sure. So do you think it's, it's like a, just working with a certain level of professionalism, you know, the the one professional to another, you know, the music supervisor dealing with publishing company, they know the drill, they speak the same language. Everybody knows 
what needs to get done as opposed to some musician that's like, okay, uh, no, what is a master? Right. Exactly. It kind of gets, it gets <laughs> yeah. you out of your own way in some of those negotiations, um, or in some of those talks, all obviously those are all extreme examples, but uh, yeah, just having somebody, a manager or somebody in between you and the process, just to make sure everything is running smoothly, uh, and speaks the same language is, is a hundred percent important. Okay, great, great. So, uh, it, could you, would you mind saying, I mean, what, what kind of money are we looking at? I mean, cause this is the music money podcast, yeah. you know, is there an average on what, you know, that you said like upfront fees and then ongoing royalties? Yeah. Um, is there an average? I'm trying to, th- I'm trying to think what I can say. Cause some of the contracts have like, I can't just, dis- I can't disclose how much I got paid for specific usages, sure. but I'll say cable television, getting a song on cable TV can pay anywhere from maybe $250 up to maybe a thousand dollars for just, mm-hmm. I would say ge- general purpose shows, storage wars, uh, yeah, anything anything that's on cable, I would say that's kind of that's a ballpark. And then there's primetime cable. So mm-hmm. Grey's Anatomy. If you're like if you're the the song that stops people in their tracks, you, that's usually a couple thousand dollars mm-hmm. uh, for some of those placements. And then similarly for some of those buyouts on like Netflix and Hulu, those are usually in the thousands of dollars uh, as well. The the bigger money things, sometimes you hear like big sync contracts and stuff. Those are usually in commercials. Uh, I've had, obviously I haven't landed any of them or haven't like with my own stuff, speaking of like, I haven't synced my music specifically, but sometimes I'll get hit up to work on custom sync stuff for uh, big commercials. And th- some of those budgets are very, very high, anywhere from like $50,000 to $500,000, depending on on what they need. Nice. Nice. So you're, you're actively, so somebody would come to you and say, Hey, we're looking for this style of a song to basically almost like you got to make it on spec knowing, not necessarily knowing if it's going to be accepted for the commercial. Yeah. Usually the way that those work is the, com- I'm going to say this unknowingly Samsung will usually hire an ad, an ad agency to develop the commercial for them. The ad agency will then put out a feeler for either we'll do it in-house or we'll hire a music supervision company to license a mu- license music for their brand. They'll say, we want, we want a rock song. They might go into it and say, we want a Rolling Stones song. We know that. And then they'll just deal with the Rolling Stones directly. But a lot of times they'll come out and say, we want something that sounds like this. Yeah. at the ad agency level and then they'll send requests out like to my agent to a bunch of different agents that they trust to to forward on to artists and say hey do you have anything that sounds like this in your catalog and if not can you try and make something here usually it's usually within 48 hours or the turnaround times on that uh, but that's that's kind of the trickle down corporate process okay Okay. So they, so they still have music supervisors and they, they work with ad agencies or is it a different yeah, so ad agencies reaching out to the, it depends. Sometimes an ad agency, depending on the budget of the thing, um, might hire, might hire a dedicated music supervisor. So a brand that comes to mind is like Apple. Apple is known for the music that goes into their commercials and they're, they hire somebody, hire somebody with good music tastes to go and find them something that they can use in their commercial. Uh, but depending on the budget of the thing, it could be the, the company itself or the ad agency. Um, so like I had a song used in, a, I, I won't say the brand, in a rental car commercial. Um, mm. In that particular case, it was directly from the brand. They knew what they were filming. They had a request. They knew what, music they wanted it to sound like and i sent them a couple different options and they picked from there so it's it's different every time on i would say on the corporate kind of corporate side of things okay now do you have an attorney kind of i've had 
yeah, I have somebody that I call regularly. I don't have, um, I don't have a, an attorney out there like shopping me around that sort of thing, but I have somebody that I work with just professionally for contracts. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Cause I was going to say that when you start getting into licensing and, and all that kind of stuff, I mean, it's, I, I know at least with, with labels and all that, cause I, I don't know if you saw with some of the interviews I've done of uh, uh, Ron Beanstalk, he's our attorney, mm -hmm. but he's, he was the guy that pretty much taught me everything about royalties and, and licensing and all that kind of stuff. And I know it gets, it gets pretty hairy and I can imagine, you know, you would want to make sure that things are done right. Especially if you're, you're like, look, man, I'm just a guy that writes songs. I, you know, know how to use logic and that's pretty much all I'm interested in doing, but I also don't want to get screwed. Exactly. Um, oh, you start, I think you start to pick it up over time. You start mm -hmm. seeing the same things over and over in contracts and you can at least start to look out for yourself and, and at least have a gut check if something is worth pursuing or not, rather instead of hiring an attorney every time. But if you're going to sign, put your name to paper on something, have an attorney look <laughs> look over it. Yeah, for sure. So um, now you mentioned that you've got some songs actually licensed for podcasts. Yeah, that's kind of recent. I think just because of the the pandemic, like the influx of podcasts, um, it makes sense. I've had music get used or licensed to podcasts in the past but uh recently people have kind of reached out to me to see if they can do something specifically with me to either create music for their show or um license part of my catalog or something up to then outside of just friends okay well that's cool so they they actively find you yeah that yeah. hasn't been something uh just yet that I don't think I don't think my agent is out pitching podcasts, but I'm sure that the, I'm sure that a world with that is coming coming soon. Cool, cool. Now you said you also get paid uh, to do like demos and and vocal top lines for for other artists. Yeah, I do. So sometimes I get hired as a as a vocalist or as an artist to collaborate or feature on usually electronic music songs. Mm -hmm. So some uh, songs will just kind of arrive or get filtered through somehow to me, producers will reach out, their managers will reach out something and I'll either get paid by the artist themselves. Sometimes they just want to pay an upfront like session fee and have you write and sing a song. And then sometimes we'll work out a deal to kind of split, split the, the profits of, of those songs um, or, or a label will pay the advance as well for, I guess. Cool the vocals. Well, how do they find you? Um, that's a, that's a good question that I should probably, I should probably figure out. I'm a marketing out. guy. I'm always wondering, how do you market this, that, that you do that as a service? I think, you know? I think a lot of this stuff, if I can speak broadly, uh, of the opportunities I've been fortunate to have, have, I feel like just been from putting myself out there early on was saying yes to a lot of opportunities that I might not have before. And I think, uh, you're again speaking to the power of the internet. I met a guy in some Facebook group. We were just talking about music production. We liked similar artists. Started message messaging each other. Ended up making a song together. Ended up releasing it. Um, he, yeah, it's uh, power of the internet. Like he met, then met somebody else who helped us sign the song to this indie label in the Netherlands. Um, the indie label, I think, then went on to have like a Warner music distribution deal. So our song kind of ramped up into it. It was just like by working on a lot of music, these opportunities started to come up. And then people from that roster of the label would reach out to me who are friends with this other producer. It's the your network just starts to, to grow, I think, as you as you work on a lot of different stuff. And that was something I I wasn't actively pursuing, but now seems to be uh, something that I enjoy doing, working with with people all over. Yeah, it's it's in a way, it's just sort of like you're out there, you're doing the thing. Yeah. Over time, you're persisting and you're continuing to just create and you know, things may not always be going exactly the way you want them to all to go at all times, but you're just actively out there. You don't quit. You're, you're focused. And then over time, people just kind of come into your life. And then somebody you maybe forgot about that you did something with last year. Now they're come back into your life with a new opportunity, you know, or, Hey, are you still working? Oh yeah, man. You know, yep. can you work with me on this this week? Oh yeah, I'll be able to fit you in. You know, so that that's cool. That's, that's very cool. And, and you're right. I mean, the, the amazing internet, here we are again. You know, because you said New, New Zealand, 
Is that what you said? Or in the Netherlands? Or, or in the Netherlands. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, um, yeah. So like one of our our singer Yaya, she's had some songs that have one blew up in um, South America somewhere, and then she had another one that went in Italy. And it's been these kind of these collaborations or whatever you want. She basically just sang on these on these tunes, mm-hmm. and they're completely different than the style of music that we've done. She's like, "Hey, I'm blowing up in Italy." And I'm like, "Hey, I'd love to tour in Italy." My, yeah, my don't, wife don't forget. Uh, so um, now you also said that you've gotten royalties from songs when you were where you were signed to an indie label. Are you do you still have that? Are you still on an indie label or what, kind what of that those are about? those are more like one off contracts. A, a lot of the record business um, seems to be shift. There's a lot of like newer labels c- kind of coming up that are just signing singles or limited limited runs or an EP's worth of songs or something rather than doing a wide breadth uh, contract. So I'm still technically in some of those contracts with labels uh, for different releases or things I sang on that sort of thing. So that's again, mailbox, <laughs> mailbox money. Cause yeah. uh, one, adv- obviously one advantage of working with a record label is they get paid when you get paid kind of thing. So it's in their best interest to, to promote, promote the songs and get them out there as, as much as they can. So do you recall how that all went down? I mean, did they approach you? Did you approach them with the, with the indie label that were in question? Uh, it's, so it's not just one specific label. There's a, a couple different, ones um that's again kind of that just branching off of that story uh, i was just on like i met somebody online became friends with them we started working on music uh that we were able to submit to a lot of these labels you you can if you find the right people you can find out who the a and r is at those labels and send them stuff uh, if the label accepts submissions and so we sent it to this one label and that relationship ended up working out positively and the song did uh, I think did pretty well, got onto some cool playlists and all that sort of stuff. And then from that, I ended up meeting more artists either on that label or artists from other labels because producers and artists are always kind of watching who's releasing what and who should they be collaborating with. And that just, it started to to grow on its own. So but just by proxy of continuing to work, I started developing relationships with the people that worked at different labels. We would send a demo. I'd get introduced in an email thread to, oh, we sent this demo to this person or this this person got back to us and she wants to talk more about. So it was, it's been yeah. completely organic um, in, growing, in growing that over the last year and a half or so. And I think if there's any lesson to be learned here, because I, I do, in fact, the, the question of, mu- of record labels comes up all the time, especially in, in Reddit and other, other forums, I could tell a sort of young artists that are, you know, they haven't even uploaded their stuff to Spotify yet, or haven't really done much, you know, should I, should I send this to a label? You know, mm-hmm. should I send this to an indie label? Should I send this to a major label? I mean, what are your thoughts on that? I think, what do I, what do I think? I think that there's a, a lot of answers to that question. And I hate, I hate to say that it depends because I know that's just kind of a platitude that gets, gets me out of the, the answer, but it really, really does depend. I think where, wherever you are in your career, I think it's important to taste. It's important to taste all of the, the parts of the career um, so that you know what's going on. It's important that you release yourself so that you can understand how to promote a song. And so that when you do get to the point of, starting to send to labels or labels approaching you, you know exactly what it is to look for that they may or may not be able to do for you. So mm. yeah, you're able to see like how many plays do they get on their, on their releases on Spotify playlists? How many editorial playlists are they getting? Are they getting sync licensing for their artists? Are they like, do your homework and see if the artists signed to those labels are doing the things that you want to be doing uh, in your career. And I think in some of those cases, it, yeah, it makes sense um, to use a label as a stepping stone. They definitely still have a leg up at Spotify uh, for playlist prefer- preference and, and stuff like that. So can't knock, can't knock the hustle on that one, but there are yeah. plenty of cool indie labels out there doing good work um, as well. I, I think... Yeah, I think it depends. I think there's plenty of great labels and there's plenty of terrible 
record labels and you just got to do your homework on what makes what makes the most sense for you wherever you are in your career yeah because my actually our, our manager i was talking to him this morning and he he's talked a lot about approaching major labels and stuff with our, with our band and i and i just told him i said look i, I don't I haven't heard. When's the last time that you heard about a band getting signed by a major record label? I mean, I can't think of one. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's just, it seems like that's not the world we live in. People still love to go listen to live music and they still love to watch bands play. And there's still a lot of, there's a lot of great bands that are out there, but you know, I don't know that they're on major labels and they might be on indie labels mm -hmm. um, that specify maybe in that type of genre. Um, you know, more like jam bands or, or, um, you know, funk or something, something to that effect. But I just don't, I don't seek. So I just basically told him, I said, don't even bother. Don't, I don't really care about having a major label record deal. I'm kind of, I did when I was in my twenties back when they actually signed bands and grunge was blowing up and all that kind of stuff. But in today's age, you know, and it's, I would be, even if I had a, uh, um, an indie label that we wanted to possibly work with us. I'm enough of a, an adult now, you know, and have been, been done music marketing now for eight plus years that I would be asking those tough questions. You know, it's basically, you know, no, I absolutely understand the idea of having somebody do the work because it is a lot of work. Um, you know, just do it. And there are so many things that I know I should be doing. I just don't have the time or the, the knowledge or both. Um, you know, so to have a team that would actually do it for you would be fantastic. But, you know, then I have to ask, you know, okay, so how does the money get distributed? Because we're, you know, there's a lot of mouths that need to be fed here. So I don't know, we've, we've wrestled with that question for so long, but in the meantime, I don't stop. We don't stop. We just keep pushing and keep doing our thing and getting fans and we sell to fans directly and, and promote directly. And that's what works for us. And I think that's, that's an, a great way to to do it. If you can go direct to fan, I, like there's a, an economy of scale with signing with a record label. I like, unless you're at a certain point where you're the number of units you're moving or the number of opportunities that are knocking at your door as an artist, it's a tough justification to give up that amount of money to a mm -hmm. label, usually in a, like an 80, 20 deal to give up that huge portion of your money in exchange for what's left at the top of the ladder. Like you have to be knocking at the door at the top for it to make sense. And if you're below that threshold, doing it direct to fan or building your own business and saying, Hey, I'm putting out a record. I'm going to hire the PR company. I'm going to book the tour. I'm going to consult with this marketing agency, whatever it is to like run your own business, because that's what the label is going to do, except they're going to charge you. They're mm. going to charge you for it against whatever money you're about to make. So it's not free. They're not just going to sign you and do it for free. So if you're at that point on your own, that's what I, that's what I meant. Like taste all the different pies so that you know what it is you're looking for when it comes time to sign with a label. Um, Cause they're not just going to like turn on the, the fame switch for you. They're going to, yeah, like that doesn't happen. You got to be able to come in with a plan. Yeah, exactly. And even, even back when bands did get signed quite a bit, in fact, Ron Beanstalk and I, the attorney talked about that, you know, about those, you hear this con constant nightmare stories about, you know, bands that would get signed, but their, their, their record was never even released yeah. because, you know, the, like the A&R guy got fired the following week or, or the CEO, you know, got fired and the new guy came in and, you know, and took over and it's like, but what about our deal? You're like, and who are you again? You know, or, you know, so, so that kind of stuff, but it's just, I mean, it's, and so, so many people, at least back in, back in the day, they didn't never felt like they were, it was the validation that came with, I got a record deal, or I've got a great manager, or I've got an attorney, or I've got a great agent. You know, it's like, they crave that validation to say that, oh, you're a legitimate artist, yeah. not realizing that that's really just the starting point. It's good that you got there, but it does certainly, like you said, doesn't guarantee success or certainly doesn't guarantee fame. Um, it's a, it opens up, uh, I, I do think record labels do get vilified a lot because they're an easy punching bag for, uh, for a lot of problems that are in the music business. But I think like on the positive side there, they are able to open up doors for you as an artist that you're not always going to have coming up on your own. Like even songwriting, if you're not signed to a publisher and you're in the professional songwriting space in Nashville, it's hard to get into the room 
with other people mm-hmm. who are assigned to publishers because nine times out of 10, they're giving up a chunk of the money just by being, they're assigned to a publishing company, their publishing company is taking a share. They don't want to sit with somebody who's getting to keep a hundred percent of the money. So there's like uh-huh. politics and stuff that, that wow. are baked into you signed to a label. Yeah. It's going to be easier to work and collaborate with other people that are signed on that label. So there are positive things uh, that come, that come with it that aren't necessarily financial. Yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. Well, Nicholas, you have been more than generous with your time. We have went almost an hour and a half. Oh my I, goodness. I, see all, I know. Right. So I think we're definitely going to do, I'll, I'll break this into a couple episodes because there's so much good stuff here. I'd hate for people to, to miss any of it, honestly. So, and you covered this myriad of topics from Spotify to sync to a bunch of other stuff. So generous, man. I really, really appreciate it. And um, it's, it's been a great meeting. You really, we've really gotten to know each other over this call. Yeah, it's great uh, great I, chatting with you. Thanks for reaching out. I wish you certainly the wish you the best in LA. Um, and I do have some friends there that I might have you reach out to and it never hurts to have those connections. So. Yeah, that'd be great. Anybody anybody to grab coffee with, that'd be, uh, that'd be an awesome, awesome certainly. thing. Certainly.